behalf of AFSEA International and the U.S. Naval Institute, welcome back to the second day and the final day of West 2020. Before we begin this morning's program, I'd like to make a few administrative announcements. If you have not already done so, make sure to download the event app sponsored by Deloitte. The link in the QR code can be found on the inside front cover of the show guide. If the app doesn't answer all of your questions about the event, be sure to stop by the Knowledge Center located in the 1500 aisle of the exhibit hall. The Knowledge Center is your one-stop venue to get all your event questions answered. At the conclusion of this morning's keynote and all other sessions throughout the conference, please complete the session surveys located on each session within the app. We appreciate your feedback and we'll use it to make West 2021 even better. Visit USNI News and the AFSEA website throughout the week for news and summary reports. Additionally, recordings and presentations from the conference will be available on the West Conference website. At this time, please join me in welcoming to the stage Vice Admiral Peter Daly, U.S. Navy retired, publisher and chief executive officer of the U.S. Naval Institute. Good morning. Good morning, welcome to day two of West 2020. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our morning keynote speaker, Secretary Ellen Lord, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. Part of joining the Department of Defense, Ms. Lord served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Textron Systems Corporation, a subsidiary of Textron Incorporated from October 2012 to June 2017. In this role, she led a multi-billion dollar business along a broad range of products and services supporting defense, homeland security, aerospace industries, and customers around the globe. Ms. Lord has more than 30 years of experience in the defense industry, serving in a variety of capacities. She's a former vice chairman of the National Defense Industrial Association. She's a former director of the U.S. India Business Council. We're proud at the Naval Institute that she's a former trustee of the United States Institute's Naval Institute's Foundation. Urgent business kept her from being able to take the time to travel all the way to the West Coast today. So she is joining us by VTC from the Pentagon. We have her, we have, uh, she can hear us and she'll be able to see our audience, but I wanted to make sure you knew that for questions and answers today, you'll have to come up to the podium to ask your questions so that she could see you, and I think it'll be a better interaction. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Lord. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Pete, for the introduction. I'm sorry that I'm not able to make um, the trip to sunny, warm San Diego this week, but I appreciate the opportunity to address everyone from here inside the Pentagon. The National Defense Strategy, the NDS, remains the department's guidepost as we adapt the force to this new environment of great power competition. The shift from countering violent extremist organizations to countering coercion and subversion through predatory economics, political subversion, and military force. The U.S.'s adversaries seek to erode the sovereignty of weaker states. Over time, this actively undermines the current international rules-based order that generations before us worked to achieve. The United States and its allies and partners constructed a free and open international order to better safeguard our liberty and people from aggression and coercion. And that's what differentiates us from aggressors. When we, the U.S., go into a fight, we do not go alone. Before I discuss acquisition and sustainment goals and priorities, I want to reflect briefly on what our organization has accomplished over the last year. My role as undersecretary is to ensure that we have an acquisition system that moves at the speed of relevance. I am committed to the sustainment of our weapon systems because proactive sustainment drives readiness. To that end, 2019 was a momentous year for the team, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Within AMS, 
We are rethinking the way we do business and are reshaping ANS as a policy and governance organization that enables the services and defense agencies to get capability to the warfighter quickly and cost effectively. For example, DOD manages 87 major defense acquisition programs and all but nine have been delegated to the services. We are enabling speed by employing our new Agile Acquisition Framework, or AAF. In addition, we've seen a 15% reduction of Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplements, or DFARS, clauses from 352 to 298, a 60% reduction in DFARS publication backlog from 128 to 50, and a 50% reduction in procurement administrative lead time, or PALT, from 32 to 16 months for multiple Pathfinder projects. The results for 13 major program administration lead time or PALT pilots, including six foreign military sales pilots, average 16 months savings and $1.5 billion in cost savings from a $15 billion baseline to get programs under contract. Negotiating options to existing contract requirements is an effective technique allowing for timely and effective procurements. This technique helps speed delivery in both U.S. and FMS acquisition because when an option is exercised in lieu of a new cycle of request for proposal, proposal negotiation, significant fault can be eliminated. Our Defense Pricing and Contract Organization, or DPC, issued a June 2018 memo to emphasize the use of options. In FY 2019, the inclusion of 32 options in major contract actions potentially saved over 53 years of Paul. Including, included in these major actions were seven FMS procurements, which potentially saved over 11 years in Paul. These major procurements that DPC conducted peer reviews on were proposed at over $79.4 billion with negotiated results of $71.4 billion. Thus far in FY 2020, the inclusion of 40 options, including multi-year buys, will potentially save over 66 years of pulp. To date, three FMS items have potentially saved over five years of pulp. The DPC peer review programs were proposed at over $67.3 billion with negotiated results of $64.3 billion. Recent legislation and regulatory revisions address the time and cost burdens of submitting certified cost or pricing data. The recent legislation includes Section 857 of FY16 NDAA, Treatment of Goods and Services by Nine Traditional defense contractors as commercial items, Section 872 of the FY17 NDAA, Value Analysis for Determining Price Reasonableness, and Section 811 of the FY18 NDAA, Modifications to Cost or Pricing Data and Reporting Requirements, which increased the Truth in Negotiations Act, TINA, threshold to $2 million. The department is also increasing the utilization of other transaction agreements, or OTAs, which do not require the submission of certified cost or pricing data, which often drives over six months of time. For other transactions, for basic research purposes, Title 10 U.S. Code 2371, required criteria are the focus of the project is basic, applied, or advanced research, to the maximum extent practical, the research contemplated in the instant project does not duplicate research being done under other DOD programs. To get the maximum extent practical, the funds from the government do not exceed the total amount provided by the other parties. The use of a standard contract, grant, or cooperative agreement for such project is not feasible or appropriate. For other transactions for prototypes, Title 10, U.S. Code 2371B, required criteria are the prototype projects are directly relevant to enhancing the mission effectiveness of military personnel and the supporting platforms, systems, components, or materials proposed to be acquired or developed by DOD, 
or to improvement of platforms, systems, components, or materials in use by the armed forces. And the prototype OT satisfies at least one of the following conditions. There is at least one non-traditional defense contractor or non-profit research institute, institution participating to a significant extent in the prototype project, or all significant participants in other transactions, other in the transaction, other than the federal government, are small businesses or non-traditional defense contractors, or at least one-third of the total cost of the prototype project is to be paid out of funds provided by parties other than the federal government, or the senior procurement executive for the agency determines in writing that exceptional circumstances justify the use of a transaction that provides for innovative business arrangements or structures that would not be feasible or appropriate under a contract or would provide an opportunity to expand the defense supply base in a manner that would not be practical or feasible under a contract. So why would you do all of this? Because it cuts one to two years from a traditional procurement. Furthermore, the department has initiated a contract financing study that will consider how best to attract small businesses and non-traditional defense contractors as a major tenant. The study will further examine the existing types of current contract financing methods, such as progress payments and performance-based payments, something our industrial pay base has been paying very, very close attention to. Another major accomplishment was the rewrite of the 5000 series, the overarching policy guide on DOD acquisition. This overhaul is the most transformational change to acquisition policy in years and an effort that we anticipate to have long-lasting positive effects. The 5000 rewrite was the decomposition of a large, a very large policy document into six clear, distinct pathways. These multiple pathways facilitate the flexibility and efficiency needed to capitalize on simplified acquisition methods and improve DOD's ability to benefit from commercial sector offerings. Since a large number of you are probably looking at your phones right now, why don't you go ahead and visit AAF, AAF is for Adaptive Acquisition Framework, dot D-A-U dot E-D-U for the pathway graphic and more information. The six pathways you will see on the site's homepage are one, urgent capability acquisition, two, middle tier of acquisition, three, major capability acquisition, which is our traditional acquisition pathway, four, software acquisition, which I want to talk more about later, defense business systems, and acquisition of services. The goal is to simplify acquisition policy, tailor acquisition approaches, empower program managers, conduct data-driven analysis, actively manage risks, and emphasize sustainment. The acquisition policy rewrite included DOD instructions for each acquisition pathway and functional area. These subordinate functional areas are engineering, test and evaluation, cybersecurity, analysis of alternatives, cost estimate, intellectual property, tech and program protection, human systems integration, acquisition intelligence, and information technology. One of the functional areas I want to touch on briefly is intellectual property. In 2019, the department released its first policy on intellectual property to support more effective approaches to acquisition and licensing of IP. IP must be addressed during initial contract award if it is to be effective. Acquiring and licensing the appropriate IP is vital for ensuring systems will remain functional sustainable, upgradable, and affordable. The policy highlights DOD's IP principles and helps guide DOD to deliver world-class capabilities at an affordable cost. In other words, the government will pay for what it needs. It does not need to own all of industry's intellectual property, only which allows the ability to sustain and upgrade systems. The policy further establishes an IP cadre, which is developing DOD guidance, training, and assistance 
to the whole of government effort to address protection of data rights. The overall goal for this policy is to bring balance by providing the best capabilities to the warfighter in the most efficient and cost-effective manner for the taxpayer by respecting, rewarding, and incentivizing industry for continued innovation. At the end of January, we rolled out the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. The CMMC is our DOD metric to measure a company's ability to secure its supply chain. It's no secret that we are at cyber war every day. Cybersecurity risks threaten the defense industry, our national security, as well as our partners and allies. Throughout the CMMC development process, my number one priority has been to communicate, communicate, and communicate again. We continue to involve industry associations, academia, the military services, and Congress in an effort to hear all concerns and suggestions. Now that CMMC is released, we are focusing on the remaining timeline, selecting third-party vendors, creating CMMC training material, rulemaking, and completing an agreement with the newly established CMMC accreditation body. The certification body will certify auditors. This is very, very similar to how ISO was rolled out for quality. The CMMC team is currently working with multiple countries, including Canada, the UK, Denmark, Italy, Australia, Singapore, Sweden and Poland, as well as the EU cybersecurity body. All of these countries and groups are asking whether or not they can adopt our CMMC for their use, which is exciting. In May 2019, my office formally delivered the Defense Innovation Board Software Acquisition Practices Study. We call it the SWAP study to Congress. The report supported our effort to accelerate DOD's approach to software acquisition and development, both from a technical and business process point of view. Implementation of the study began immediately, and with respect to creating new acquisition pathways, actually began before the report was for formally turned over. In our effort to employ a comprehensive approach to software modernization, it was important to me to act upon recommendations quickly. In partnership with the military services and other OSB elements, we actioned the SWAP recommendations in conjunction with the most relevant recommendations from previous reports, including the Defense Science Board design and acquisition of software for defense systems and the Section 809 panel report. AMS remains focused on supporting all three lines of the national defense strategy, which are one, restore military readiness as we build a more lethal force, two, expand and strengthen alliances and partnerships, and three, bring business reform to the Department of Defense. Building on the three lines of effort, my senior leadership team and I worked last summer and ever since to develop and refine our ANS specific mission and goals. The ANS mission is to enable the delivery and sustainment of secure and resilient capabilities to the warfighter and international partners quickly and cost-effectively. Under the mission, we have six ANS goals. One, enable innovative acquisition approaches that deliver warfighting capability at the speed of relevance. Two, build a safe, secure, and resilient defense industrial base. Three, ensure safe and resilient DOD installations. Four, Increase weapon system mission capability while reducing operating cost. Five, promote acquisition and sustainment initiatives with key international partners. And six, recruit, develop, and retain a diverse acquisition and sustainment workforce. I'd like to step through each of these goals very briefly. So, to begin, the first goal is enable innovative acquisition approaches. The most obvious example here is the 5,000 rewrite I highlighted earlier. Successful implementation of these acquisition change efforts will reduce timelines, lower costs, and improve quality while rapidly introducing new technology to enhance the capability of the warfighter. 
A key focus area for the team now is to ensure that we have business processes that allow us to rapidly implement technological advances. I believe that our business practices have held us back from implementing technology in the past, and I want to change that. I spoke earlier about the rewrite of the 5000 series acquisition policy and the six new pathways. I'd like to talk for a moment about the software acquisition policy, as software is so fundamental to everything we do in the department. Based on the findings of the Defense Innovation Board Software Acquisition and Practices Study, the Office of the Secretary of Defense is pursuing pilot programs in FY 2021 to evaluate and experiment with a single type of funding or color of money for software and digital technology. ANS and the Comptroller have collaborated with Congress to create a new budget activity called BA-8 under the Research Development Test and Evaluation Office to support the pilot programs. We have partnered with the services and fourth estate agencies to identify nine software intensive systems as candidates for the pilot. Pilots include both business systems and weapon systems. The detailed list of programs being considered and funding amounts will soon be released. Software and digital technology funds are being moved into BA-8. They were previously allocated across RDT&E, procurement, and sustainment. So why is this important? Software is similar to hardware in the sense that it does follow a cycle of development, test, production, and sustainment. However, the difference is the speed in which software can move through this cycle versus hardware. I like to think of hardware-enabled but software-defined systems. So a software update can be coded, tested, and pushed to operations in hours, sometimes in minutes. Thus, the cycle through the color of money is continuous. The software and digital technology pilot allows for a controlled environment to test if a single appropriation facilitates a faster cycle to deploy operational capability, as has been suggested both by our internal and external reports. Also, we clearly communicate the importance of software and digital technology when there is a specific appropriation. OSD needs congressional appropriations approval and authority to proceed in the FY 2021 Appropriations Act. Evaluation metrics and procedures to evaluate the effectiveness of a single budget activity or funding type for software and digital technology have been developed and if approved to proceed, the pilot programs will run for multiple years and be evaluated using the above measures. If a single budget activity is shown to aid program success in software and digital technology, that evidence will be used to request the creation of a new software and digital technology appropriations. One key point to make here is that the goal eventually is to ask for a new type of money, a new appropriation, in an, in an effort to increase our ability to do oversight also have insight and deliver warfighting capability more effectively. So goal number two, build a safe, secure, and resilient defense industrial base. This goal is best explained by looking at it as a defensive effort as well as an offensive effort. On defense, one example is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS an interagency committee that reviews certain transactions involving foreign investment in U.S. businesses and whether foreign investment in U.S. businesses will have an adverse national security result. The interagency team includes the Departments of Treasury, which chairs it, Justice, Homeland Security, Commerce, Defense, State, Energy, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. When appropriate, the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, Council of Economic Advisors, National Security Council, National Economic Council, and Homeland Security Council, all are White House entities, observe and participate in CFIUS activities. The committee can recommend mitigation or even block trans or recommend a blocking of a transaction to the president who makes the final determination. But we want to do more than be on defense. So on the offensive, our industrial policy team has launched a trusted capital initiative. 
This concept takes a more proactive approach towards protecting U.S. supply chains, domestic manufacturers, and American technology from foreign adversaries like China, who clearly seek to under undermine our national security. We have deployed screening criteria for both capital providers and companies providing equipment and services to DOD to ensure that no adversarial capital is part of these companies. In other words, they are trusted companies. We then bring innovative companies, typically small ones, together with capital providers. In essence, we create an environment where trusted capital can be deployed to trusted companies. In November, the department and the Texas A&M University system co-sponsored Drone Venture Day, where dozens of U.S. manufacturers of unmanned aerial systems and counter UAS systems met with trusted capital providers to explore mutually beneficial business partnerships focused on national security concerns. Drone Venture Day represented the inaugural event in a series of trusted capital opportunities to build an ecosystem where trusted capital providers and domestic companies can limit adversarial foreign access to technology and strengthen domestic manufacturing in the defense industrial base. Trusted capital will be holding and partnering with the services, the military services, on other events throughout this year, including AFWORKS South by Southwest Pitch Day, which will be March 12th through 13th in Austin, Texas, which will focus on artificial intelligence, quantum, satellite, cybersecurity, autonomous aircraft, and supply base and logistics. We will also partner with the Army at Tech Search, March 17th to 18th in Huntsville, Alabama, which will focus on biotech, radars, machine learning, and advanced batteries. Our challenge is to scale this activity, which will be through a website that allows vetted manufacturing companies and equity firms to explore potential business relationships. We'll provide the rules, then we step back. So goal number three, ensure safe and resilient DOD installations. In our effort to make sure DOD installations are resilient, we are looking at small modular reactors. We are talking about energy resiliency here. So if you go off the grid, if you lose your power supply, we have these advanced, very small modular reactors that have the potential to really enhance installation resilience through assured access to reliable, quality power in support of our critical missions and remote operations. In the FY19 NDAA, um, we had the requirement um, for the Department of Energy and DOD to explore a pilot program to demonstrate at least one very small reactor at DOD locations by 2027. We are working with DOE, DOD, and undertaking two parallel efforts, one within um, ANS we have our DASD for Energy pursuing demonstration of a commercially developed nuclear regulatory commission license about two megawatt um, electric um, SMR, small modular reactor, to power at a permanent domestic military installation. And then within our research and engineering group in the Strategic Capabilities Office, or SCO, um, they are funding development and construction of a prototype advanced mobile nuclear microreactor for use in remote and forward operating locations to power battlefield weapons and base camps and reduce logistical risk created by the need for fuel. SCO, SCO received appropriations in FY20 NDAA to pursue development of its prototype. On December 5th, um, 2019, um, Ms. Young, our DASD for Energy, met with her DOE counterpart to discuss DOD's small modular reactor demonstration effort to evaluate the energy resilience capability and cost effectiveness of this technology at a remotely located domestic installation with unreliable power and high energy costs. During the meeting, DOE shared that DOD's interest has incentivized the nuclear industry to develop and scale small modular reactors to meet DOD requirements, which should help drive the cost competitiveness of the technology. Goal number four is to increase weapon system mission capability while reducing operating costs. As the department's largest joint and international acquisition program in history, I focus a significant amount of time on the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. 
My office and the F-35 Joint Program Office continue to improve the execution of the program, including development, production, and sustainment of the aircraft. Last October, we announced a $34 billion F-35 contract for lots 12 through 14 for the delivery of 478 F-35s. Of note, in overall cost, from lot 12 to lot 11, we have seen the following reductions. 12.8% for the A model, 12.3% for the B, and 13.2% for the C model. Reducing sustainment costs to meet service-defined affordability constraints is a huge priority for our government and industry team. Efforts to increase readiness will require investments in the near term, but these investments will create a more effective F-35 sustainment system, driving down life cycle costs. The department issued a new F-35 Life Cycle Sustainment Plan, LCSP, that identified nine success elements to achieve warfighter requirements. Of these nine lines of effort, we are making strides to address three key elements that are vital to improving F-35 fleet readiness and meet warfighter requirements. Accelerating organic depot repair capability, improving reliability and maintainability, and delivering ODIN, the Operational Data Integrated Network, to replace ALICE and improve the F-35 fleet sustainment and readiness performance. Goal number five is promote acquisition and sustainment initiatives with key international partners. AMS is leading the department's efforts to deepen engagement on acquisition matters with our allies and partners. Culture is shifting to integrate early planning for exportability into our requirements and acquisition systems, ensuring that DOD programs plan for technology sharing and foreign sales from the outset. ANS's specific efforts to integrate international acquisition and net exportability planning across the defense acquisition system help strengthen the U.S. defense industrial base. Senior leaders across the department continue to stress to our EU partners that European Defense Fund, or EDF legislation, and permanent structured cooperation, PESCO, guidelines for third-party participation must permit the United States and other non-EU NATO allies to take part and lend our expertise to these initiatives. We need to pursue efforts that complement NATO activities and bolster transatlantic cooperation, not ones that are competitive or duplicative, especially as allies take a closer look at the challenges posed by a growing and more assertive China. Challenges such as the theft of intellectual property and non-transparent investments threaten us. NATO allies must carefully consider the long-term risks of the economic and commercial choices they make, particularly regarding the integration of Chinese telecommunications into European infrastructure. Improving DOD planning for exportability will increase industry competitiveness, strengthen the defense industrial base, and lower unit costs for the U.S. national defense. Foreign sales and cooperation in research, development, and acquisition allow for system interoperability between allies and partners, which is incredibly important because when we fight, we do not do so alone. Goal six, recruit, develop, and retain a diverse acquisition and sustainment workforce. Two extremely important initiatives to cover here. One, DAU transformation and workforce transformation. DAU, the Defense Acquisition University, is a very important tool for the workforce. We are currently piloting DAU credentials in the areas of Agile, Digital Engineering, Services for Acquisition. These are both for acquisition professionals and non-acquisition professionals. Stemming from customer feedback, our program managers, our contract professionals, this credential program is intended to help those professionals meet emerging needs for specific skills in the workplace. The program provides responsive and timely, the key here is timely learning to grow and deepen skills. By shifting away from the three tiers of learning blocks front-loaded in a person's career, 
toward a more lean set of core learning complemented by one or more specialty credentials, workforce members are better prepared to perform their job and can more quickly get the additional training they need when job requirements change. I'm proud of DAU's modernization effort. In June, for instance, DAU hosted TEDx DAU, where 12 speakers from across DOD and industry prompted attendees to find the decisive edge in an array of ideas, including fostering a culture of creativity and curiosity, focusing on outcomes instead of requirements, leading from where we are and using critical thinking personal courage, and risk-taking, and more. Also in September, DAU hosted the AAF training event. So remember, that's the Adaptive Acquisition Framework, where service acquisition executives, program executive officers, program managers, and other key stakeholders met to talk through AAF just before the final push to get it signed and published. It was important to hold this event to get critical feedback from the individuals who would be utilizing AAF the most. In addition to the transformation at the Defense Acquisition University, ANS is partnering with the services in DAU to streamline and modernize the outdated 30-year-old, yes, 30-year-old acquisition workforce framework. The complexity of 20 acquisition career fields will be simplified into the Agile Acquisition Workforce Framework, a two-part framework common in industry, business in industry, for both business and technical areas. Our essential technical acquisition and sustainment function will continue within the simplified business and technical framework. Our DAU transformation and the Agile Acquisition Framework are part of our priority to modernize talent management for the defense acquisition workforce. So with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to push a lot of information your way, but I believe this is a critical um, toolkit for all of our acquisition and contract professionals to use. So Pete, back to you. Well, thank you, Secretary Lord. That was a lot to unpack, and I think we have a lot of questions, and uh, we're going to bring people up to the podium so that you can both uh, see and hear the questioner. And I ask people to queue up. Um, it's not every day you get to ask the Secretary of Defense, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, a question. But I'll kick it off just as an icebreaker to say first, thank you for your remarks. And to ask this question, it appears that the top line uh, for the foreseeable future may be relatively flat and maybe even in real terms decline. And what do you see from your end for the impact that that may bring? For instance, what will be the difference in the way that you take as an approach for your major acquisition programs, if any, under this flat to potentially real decline top line environment? Thank you. Great question. Um, you're absolutely correct. Um, we are probably only going to have a minor increase in FY21. Um, we had about seven, um, 704.6 billion enacted for 20. Our FY21 budget request is 705.4 billion. So really um, that's a decline in buying power. So what we did when we developed this year's budget is made sure that it was a strategy-driven budget. We go back to the NDS Great Power Competition. So first, it's strategy-driven. Secondly, we needed to make sure we had what we call irreversible momentum. So we made sure we funded all of the major programs over the fit-up. In other words, we didn't just fund one or two years and then hope we could in future years find the funding. So our response is to make sure we fully fund major acquisition programs. Thank you. All right, next questioner was uh, Sam Legrone from USNI News. Good morning, ma'am. Um, I had a JSF uh, acquisition question. Um, given that the F-35 is, uh, production is spread out so far internationally, are you all uh, experiencing or anticipating any uh, delays in production due to uh, concerns around the coronavirus? Thank you. 
So the coronavirus is something uh, that we are meeting on as a leadership team multiple times a week and taking a variety of preventative actions. We have no impact at this point in time for the Joint Strike Fighter. We do have a global supply chain, um, but we follow that carefully. Right now, we see no effect, but we are looking across the entire department at any and all impacts that um, the coronavirus would have either to readiness or to modernization. So more to come on that. Good morning, Madam Secretary. If past conflicts are any indication, in a major power conflict, munitions consumption is likely to exceed all pre-conflict expectations. Are you satisfied where we are today with our industrial basis capacity to rapidly ramp up production of munitions and other consumables, and also resiliency and dispersion with regard to uh, attacks like cyber attacks, sabotage, and so forth? Or do you think there's more work that needs to be done in those areas? Okay, I keep turning around so I can see people asking the question, and you get the award that's about five questions in one there. Um, so to begin with, munitions demand tend to be lumpy, and I think that's a challenge for the industrial base. So we are working very hard with the joint staff and the services to understand the demand signal, to be able to give a clearer perspective moving out. We actually have quite a few efforts underway right now to rack and stack different munitions capabilities um, and basically line those up against O plans to understand what our needs are and where to pre-position those. I think we do have a challenge in terms of elasticity within the industrial base in order to surge um, munitions production for a variety of reasons. One is there are a number of extremely long lead items, um, which I would like to be able to focus on a little bit more in terms of early actions to put those long lead items on contract, but then we also have facility limitations, equipment limitations, and tooling limitations. So we are trying to decompose all of those to better understand um, what our ability to surge is and try to couple that with different scenarios in terms of demand signals. So that's an ongoing effort and it is a contact sport with most of our munitions suppliers. We have had munitions war rooms ongoing for the last couple of years. Now your other um, sort of vector here in terms of a question was about cybersecurity. There is no question that we are incredibly concerned about cyber vulnerabilities, whether that be um, with adversaries getting into our supply base um, computers and their systems, whether that be injecting malware, if you will, into systems themselves, um, to all sorts of things. So again, we've decomposed that problem and we have a variety of efforts. The most fundamental effort is the cyber um, maturity model certification that really looks at the resilience of our industrial base through their supply chains to make sure that their systems are secure. And our dilemma is not really usually with the first or second level supplier, it's the sixth, seventh, and eighth level supplier um, down in. And so that's why it's incredibly important that prime flow cybersecurity requirements down through the supply chain, we hold them responsible for that. We also know that most of our innovation comes from small businesses and we don't want to put small businesses out of business because doing business with the Department of Defense is so expensive in terms of onerous constraints around cybersecurity. 
So one of the things that we are running pathfinders on is to actually have our secure development environment at DOD be accessible for small businesses to come in and do development, and then we deploy the capability right from that same cloud um, that it was developed in. So that's one side of the equation. The other is on all of those fielded assets we have right now. We, for the past few years, have been doing cybersecurity assessments to understand the vulnerability of those systems. And we lean very heavily not only on the services to do that, but we use NSA's resources, which are quite exquisite, to help us on that as well. So we are not only going about assessing what those vulnerabilities in fielded systems are, but looking at mitigating those. So there's quite um, a churn of activity on cybersecurity everywhere, but I think it is a threat um, that is actually incredibly transformational in terms of vulnerabilities it places on us, and we are working very, very closely with the defense industrial base to identify and mitigate those risks. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I'm Kimberly Underwood from AFCA International's Signal Magazine. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about intellectual property rights. Um, you mentioned kind of making sure that whatever policy is developed um, has DOD paying for IP only for what they need and not um, broad IP rights. Um, and are you pulling from the services uh, experiences and pilot programs? I know the Army at Aberdeen Proving Ground was doing a pilot program with their contracting. And also, could you speak to the industry, uh, either feedback or reaction uh, so far? Thank you. Okay, so in the past, frankly, I don't believe we have trained the acquisition workforce around what intellectual property is and what we need for our programs. So the first step was to educate people. And the Army actually was the pathfinder service with intellectual property. They wrote um, a very good policy that we um, worked with them and the other services as well to adapt and roll out to all of DOD. The, the issue is, typically in the past, you would have one of two extremes. The, um, procurement team, the whole um, acquisition team, would either totally ignore intellectual property and put none into the initial contract, or they would put demands for every single piece of intellectual property. The reality is we, the government, need enough intellectual property to be able to sustain a system or if it's a platform to upgrade sensors and um, munitions and so forth as technology moves along. So it's critical that you have the critical thinking um, to understand what you need up front. And the time to address this is before you write the contract, before you negotiate the contract, so that there is actually a deep discussion um, with your industry partner on this. So what the intellectual property policy does is lay out what should be thought about, how to address it. But we know um, that it's necessary but not sufficient just to roll a policy out. We have to be able to train people. So we have an intellectual property cadre that we have stood up actually by statute. Congress required us to do it, and we are training individuals on this. And again, with DAU, we're trying to change the way we train. We don't want to just have our finger on the transmit button. Um, what we want to do is have real-life PEOs and PMs talked about what worked and what didn't work in their programs. And often, we love to tell success stories because everybody feels good. Um, but frankly, I think it's just as important, if not more 
more important to talk about mistakes that were made so we can learn from those as well. So there's a huge effort with DAU um, shooting out all types of vignettes around intellectual property and actually having PMs and PEOs come in and speak the classes about real life examples of what happened. That's why we had um, the day at DAU last year with program managers and PEOs because we wanted um, to put some examples on the stage of real problems people had with programs to enable a discussion um, versus just being transmitting the information. And uh, how about the industry input or the industry piece? So industry, um, I'm glad you reminded me of that. In all of these policies that we've developed, we have leaned very, very heavily on industry associations, AIA, NDIA, PSC, and we have what we call listening sessions where we have those groups bring companies, small, medium, large companies together, and we talk about these new policies we're rolling out and what it means to industry so that we get their input. Probably some of the most um, productive meetings I have is when I take 10 or 15 people um, from DOD and go to what we call these tri-association meetings, the three industry association meetings with CEOs and bring 15 or so CEOs in and talk about whatever is on their mind um, so that we can really listen and understand what the challenges are that industry has. Thank you very much. Hey, good morning. I'm Jared Serbu from Federal News Network. J just a quick follow-up on the software color of money issue that you raised. I, if I heard you right, I think you said that, it's, that, that the pilots are each going to run for a period of years. And I'm just wondering, do you also expect it to take years before you have results that are persuasive enough to take to Congress, or, or is the hope that you, that you could get legislation sooner than that? I am always hoping to move more quickly, but I'm also realistic. Um, this is a major muscle movement for Congress. Um, that's why we're socializing this for quite some time before we begin, because it's a very, very significant move in structurally how we get money. Um, the, I think we will begin to see results almost instantaneously because the administrative burden of making sure you are charging the right um, you know, development number, the right production number, the right sustainment number slows things down. And we know with coding we're getting feedback constantly and we want um, people to literally be able to update systems on the fly. Now that's worrisome if you're an appropriator because you're responsible for making sure you know exactly what you're getting for your money. Um, this is a little bit more of sprints and doing things differently. I believe that since we have so many really big brains out there supporting us on this effort, um, Eric Schmidt um, led the DIB study. We have all kinds of fantastic people on the Defense Science Board that have helped us. I believe there's enough inertia out there that hopefully we can move this in a year or two. But I'm also very realistic about the fact that um, we here in the department cannot give ourselves the authority. We can lay out what we're trying to do, we can provide the proof points, um, and then we can ask Congress to enact. But this is where we can have a partnership. Um, if we all believe this is the right thing to do, and I think this is a perfect case of where we are not innovating on the business side of things nearly as quickly as we are innovating technologically, where we can all work together is to have industry and industry associations echoing and amplifying what we're talking about, why this would be helpful. It's a powerful thing um, when the department and when industry have the exact same objective and can clearly articulate that to staffers and members on the Hill. So um, we would like all the support we could get. We're not sure we have it absolutely right, but that's the whole reason we want to get out there and practice this new behavior to make sure we can tailor it to get it right. And I think it will pay off. Understood. Thank you.
And uh, good morning, ma'am. Not a reporter. Sinclair Harris, old sailor working at the Logistics Management Institute. One question, the Joint Strike Fighter and the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office. As we're moving uh, to, in this, to the sustainment phase, what's your view on the progress in terms of the services, the mill services taking uh, responsibility for the sustainment of the Joint Strike Fighter and how's it going now? Thank you, over. So we continue to evolve um, the JPO as the program moves forward. In fact, the PEO six just rolled out a reorganization um, about a month ago where we have a more traditional structure um, around the program. We will always have a JPO because of the international partners, FMS. Um, customers we have. However, as you note, we are moving um, into more and more of a sustainment mode since we have so many aircraft out there and we are transitioning the sustainment of those aircraft more and more to depots um, with repair of repairables and so forth um, at the actual depot location um, with the line replaceable units versus going back and having whole systems changed out. We have quite a demand signal um, from the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps to do this because they need operational availability higher. They need cost per flight hour lower. Part of that is um, using their organic workforce to get those reps and get things more quickly done. So there is a significant demand signal. Um, we have quite a high level of engagement from um, General Barry in the Air Force, um, from Admiral Peterson in the Navy, and many others. And I would say we are picking up momentum, especially as we are upgrading Alice, um, the autonomous logistics information system that um, is now not me really moving at what I would call the speed of relevance. We are reworking that using much more modern software techniques into ODIN. That's going to be a game changer for us. That will give us information, actionable information. I think much more quickly. It's a great partnership with Lockheed Martin to get that done. That will help the services be able to streamline their operations and make sure they have the right part at the right location at the right time to keep those aircraft flying. Um, so more and more service involvement, um, contact sport. We talk a lot about it, but more importantly, we're seeing progress and action standing up the lines at the depots. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Armin Curtin with the Booz Allen Retired Navy. As a retired PAPM, I recognize and had to manage budget marks and budget cuts uh, oftentimes. And while we all recognize that uh, funding reallocations and priorities change inside the POM, how the marks were allocated oftentimes had major and significant cost and schedule impacts to our program to the point where it actually made purchases more expensive or extended uh, acquisition by one year or two. Is there a way that we can perhaps give our program managers and our PEOs uh, some more authority to perhaps manage these uh, funding priority changes in aggregate vice having to uh, defend cuts to uh, dozens of programs throughout a PEO to perhaps uh, save cost and schedule impacts. Okay, you're absolutely um, correct from my experience. Um, takes a lot of time to move money around. First of all, when we get budgets on time, that's the largest facilitator we can of delivering on time because um, continuing resolutions are extremely problematical for all the reasons we know. Um, when we have, well, that, it's a problem, let me leave it there. We are trying to monitor our budgets very carefully. If we could get um, above threshold reprogramming um, limits change, that might be helpful. Right now, I don't see much movement there, but I will tell you that there is a high level of communication with staffers about where our programs are, what the issues are. We work very closely, obviously, with our comptroller, 
And I think the more we work closely with the Hill, the better off we will be. So we will try to make things easier for the program managers and the PEOs, but I think it's really communication between those groups, comptroller, and with the staffers that really kind of grease the whole activity to happen. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Well, Secretary Lord, we tremendously appreciate your taking the time. We know that uh, given the season that we're in and some of the particular attributes of this particular season, um, you were not able to come out, but you kept your promise and addressed our audience, and we truly appreciate it, and I think we should give the Secretary a big hand. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the work we're doing. And I, particularly to industry, will say that I look at our industrial policy team as the help desk for industry. So I hope you all be um, talking to us about what we can do to better help you. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Okay, this concludes our morning keynote and uh, invite everybody to uh, join the exhibits on the floor. Thank you very much.